Welcome to Season 3 of the Rebel Rebel Podcast for Creative Rebels and Entrepreneurs. It is Episode 1, and to kick off this season, I'm joined by Dennis Cahill, the Artistic Director of the world-famous Loose Moose Theatre Company. We talk about his auspicious start in theatre way back in the day, to learning from Keith Johnstone, to teaching scientists improv for better communication, training actors, embracing failure, and we even uncover the secret to writing a book. This episode has it all. Thank you to our amazing sponsor, the Friday Saw Company, and everyone who tunes in and listens to The Rebel Rebel in 60 countries around the world. If you like the show, please share it, and feel free to suggest future guests. So, kick back, relax, and welcome to the show, Dennis Cahill. How's it going? Uh, good, good. And you? Uh, super duper, thanks super for duper. asking. It's a lovely day in Kensington. Yeah, it is. As it, as it always is in Kensington, isn't it? <laughs> it, is, it, is. it is. It's bright, it's shiny, the birds are chirping. There you go. I've got magpies. Who doesn't? <laughs> Who doesn't in this city? Because I know how much They've you love them. They've replaced every other bird. Have you noticed how there's no songbirds anymore? Just, just, just magpies. magpies. Yeah. And they don't really sing. And squirrels. Magpies and squirrels. Magpies. I'm, thi- I'm thick with squirrels. <laughs> yes. Uh, so thanks for coming down. Um, I, I want to have you on the show because I'm, uh, whether you know this or not, the Loose Moose Theater has been a gigantic influence on my entire life. Because my dad, when we first moved here in 79, that was one of the first places he took my sister and I was to Loose Moose Theater to watch theater sports. Wow. Um, yeah. And so uh, this is kind of like a dream come true. <laughs> That's what I'm here for, Michael. I'm here to make your dreams come true. <laughs> Excellent. <clears throat> uh, but I, I want to sort of get get some history on it, because mm. I know you're also doing some really cool stuff at the university. Yeah. Uh, you do some traveling. A little bit. And uh, and, and teaching and bringing... Um, so, so I'm really curious about how, how Dennis Cahill got involved and uh, how that, you know, the evolution of um, of what you've been doing. Oh, wow. How far back do you want to go? My childhood. Um, 1965. <laughs> when I was younger, when I was a young teenager, I was I, I got involved in bands <clears throat> a little bit. I right. really liked music, and, and so I started singing with, with a band. And <clears throat> I also, I, I took music at, at uh, high school, and I really, really wanted to play saxophone or nice. flute. Because those are the cool instruments at the time, uh, right? Flute was cool. Flute was cool because of oh. Jeth- Jethro Tull. Jethro Tull, sure. Yeah. So, but <laughs> I can totally was, see you like flute solo. Yeah. Well, but none were none were to be had because they'd already been taken. So I ended up with a clarinet. Oh, also Much, cool instrument. Well, but... not at the time though. Oh, and I yeah. so I wasn't particularly enthusiastic about it. Yeah. And I had this great music teacher and and he's one of the few teachers who I actually remember his name Charlie Larejo. Wow. Um he was he was just such a good teacher and everybody knew him as Charlie. He yeah. was one of those guys, right? Nice. Yeah. He one day he said to me he said um I want to have a meeting with you. Could you come to my office lunch or whatever? And I said, "Oh, sure. Okay." So I went to his office and he was him an English teacher and the drama teacher. So I was well, what's going on? Yeah. Intervention. So basically, it came down to this, that they were doing Finian's Rainbow, and they needed they needed more male vocalists. And Charlie had understood I sang in a band, nice. So they thought maybe, yeah. But Charlie was willing to make me a deal. He said, <clears throat> "I think we both realize you're not doing well in the music class." <laughs> went, yeah, and he said, "Look, I'll pass you. I'll give you a passing grade in this class." If you do I love this, this production. Yeah. I thought, well, that's brilliant. And also I'm thinking, well, I mean, it'll be some small part. Right. Right. In the chorus. Yeah. Even though probably I didn't even know there was a chorus, but sure. I, I imagined it being small. Yeah. So I agreed. And I was Finian. <laughs> so that, <laughs> that, <laughs> that brought me to the rabbit hole, which is theater. Wow. So I got really, that's when I really started, got interested in drama. I really liked being in the production, I was terrified. Yeah. But I liked being in front of an audience. I liked being on stage. Yeah. So I took drama. And then I decided, oh, I should go to university and take drama. Uh, I think to become a teacher, because at the time in Calgary, you would never think, well, I'm going to become an actor. Yeah, sure. Not from my background. Yeah. And what, what was the, like, what year was this? Oh, this would be, oh, <clears throat> 70, 
when I was in high school, 72, 73, okay. by the time I, well, I was 73 when I probably was done. Yeah. Anyway, so I, I, I was also not a great student at the time. I was very disinterested in my sure. academic career. But then I thought, oh, I, I, need, to get, I need to get my grades up oh. to, to, to be able to go to the university. Yeah. I can't remember what the, it was, the average wasn't that high, but I wasn't Like there. to get in, you mean? Yeah, to get in. You yeah. had to have a certain average. Sure, yeah. So I, <laughs> I became an honor student. What? <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. It wasn't like I, 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 I it wasn't like I couldn't. It just, I, I, I wasn't interested. But now I was interested. Sure, yeah. So I ended up at the University of Calgary, taking drama. And I, I was, I think, somewhat disappointed in my acting classes. I, I, I didn't understand why I was doing certain things. Okay. And I felt kind of, eh. But a friend of mine said, look, he said, if Keith Johnston ever comes back to the University of Calgary, you should take his acting class. You'd really like it. And Keith had been at the University of Calgary and then had gone away to teach at Queen's. Right. And sure enough, he came back the following year. And I'm looking through the calendar and I see Acting 300, the second year acting course with Keith Johnston. So I go, oh, well, I'm going to do this. Nice. So I, I took Keith's... Uh, acting class and that basically changed my life wow because then i got the improvisation bug because we certainly did improvisation in, in keith's acting classes right but also we did you know we did text we we worked on text we worked on acting right and keith's approach was totally different and i understood why i was doing things because you could immediately see the results you right. do an exercise and you go oh yeah I see the difference between that and what we did before. Right. So, and this is like the, the games of playing with status and stuff like that. To yeah. Find all, character all of the, yeah. A lot of the things that, you know, that we, we, we still do today yeah. and, and some things that Keith was probably playing with at the time that we never did again. Interesting. But it, it, to me, it was very practical. I could see the results and Keith was also, he was like, unlike any teacher I'd ever had before. <clears throat> and one, I remember one thing that he said to me that kind of surprised me was he, I, I finished doing a scene and he said, you know, Dennis, he said, every, every time you go up in front of the class, you wrinkle your forehead and it's, it's tension. And I think if we just remind you, you'll stop doing it. <laughs> well, it's, for, so first of all, no one had ever told me that before. Wow. So I'd taken like a couple of acting classes in my first year because it was split. And, yeah. Um, and, and in high school. And no one had ever said to me, you know, every time you get up in front of an audience, you wrinkle your forehead. Why wouldn't you say something like that? Like, right. I don't want to be a wrinkly guy. Right. When I'm in my <laughs> 20s. <laughs> so there was things like that that is like he was, I mean, he was honest. Um, and... You know, he would give you notes, but he would give them in a, in such a way that that you would really pay attention. Right. Like I never felt defensive with Keith. Right. Uh, so, anyways, I, so that that you know that sort of changed everything. And then in nineteen seventy seven, in the summer of seventy seven, I was directing a play of a friend of mine's. So he'd written a play. And he was a he was a, a playwriting student of Keith's, and Keith was kind of his mentor. Okay. Um, and so Greg, uh, the playwright, would go and meet with Keith, and and so as we were rehearsing this play of his, one one night he came to rehearsal, and he said, "Oh, I was talking to Keith, and Keith and Mel Tonkin are forming a, a theater company to do improvisation and plays and whatnot," and. Keith and Mel are going to ask you to be a part of it. Nice. Well, that was, you know, super exciting in yeah. 1977. <laughs> There's a song in there. And there is. There is. <laughs> <laughs> and sure enough, I, sometime later, um, I can't remember if Keith called me or Mel, but they said we're forming this company. <clears throat> and we're, we're primarily we're going to do improvisation, but we're also going to do short plays. And we'd like you to be a part of it. So that was the beginnings of, of Loose Moose. And we started doing, we, our first performance was at what was at that time, um, Alberta College of Art. Yeah. There was no design and it wasn't a university <laughs> that long ago. 
And then we did we did uh, we did uh, we did a show in Devonian Gardens. Oh my God! <laughs> they had, I think they had to turn off the fountain, or there was some <laughs> some question about the the water <laughs> in Devonian Gardens. And then we started doing weekly performances at the Pump House Theater on yeah. Sunday evenings because the theater was always available on Sunday evenings. Yeah. And this is when the Pump House was basically just a shed. Right. It was a big, like, empty shed. Yeah. And there was bleachers that the city had provided. And every Sunday we would go down and we would build a little stage. And we had we had curtain system that we would put up. Yeah. And a box of props and some costumes. And we did performances. And we usually started by doing... Um, we would, I think we'd do a short play in the first half. And then we would do improvisation in the second half with Keith leading us. Oh, fun. And then, yeah. I mean, then that grew from there. I mean, then, then theater sports started. So the company started to grow because there was more room for people to improvise. And, yeah. you know, then... So that, that I mean, that's, that's the sort of well, relatively short version of, yeah. of how I got involved in this. Huh. And, and so it, over time, like we're talking, so 77, that's yeah. quite a while ago. Yeah, <laughs> you don't need to tell me. <laughs> Long time ago. Long time ago. Um, but I mean, the, the theater has, you know, had its ups and downs and ins oh, yeah. and outs and yeah, yeah. as all things do. Um, but let's sort of fast forward to today. Yeah. And uh, so, I mean, you do some travel and teaching, but you're doing some cool stuff up at the university right now. So it's kind of not full circle necessarily, but you're back there helping people with what you know. Uh, and it's scientists, right? Well, or engineers. Um, yeah. The, so science grad students. Science so grad these, students. these are people in, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> um, People that are either doing their masters or doing their PhD in in, in sciences, and and currently, it for the most part, they're health sciences. Although yeah. every once in a while, you know, we, we get somebody in physics who you know sneaks in. <laughs> Those physicians, <laughs> physicians, um, physicians. Mm, yeah, I don't know. Mm. I don't know what you call a, yeah. a that. The, those physics people. Yeah. <laughs> um. So yeah. So the, there's a, a professor at the university, Jeff Dunn. Um, who got very much interested in science communications. And he took a course with, uh, with Beakerhead, who oh. do science communication yeah. courses. And a part of that was improvisation. <clears throat> so that kind of, you know, um, sparked something. And then he discovered Alan Alda's work in the United States, working again with scientists and working specifically with doctors as well. I had no idea. In terms of using... Using improvisation to to uh, to help them be better communicators, but also to be more empathetic to patients, and you know. Okay. So Alan Alda does this work, and he actually has a center, and Far and right. so uh, and Alan Alda does come from an improvisation background. I think he was with Second. I want to say he was with Second City, but early on. Okay. But anyways, he does come from an improvisation background. Yeah. <clears throat> Different. Different style of improvisation, but yeah. the concept is basically the same. So Jeff was talking with somebody from Science Communicators uh, of Canada. <laughs> or science. Yeah, anyways, there's an organization that I had had a bit of contact with. And so they said to Jeff, you should contact Dennis Cahill at Loose Moose. He might be able to help you out. And he did. And so he, his basic idea was to start uh, classes. Yeah to offer to science students, grad students uh, um, in general, um, using the improvisation work to help them become basically better communicators. Because, I mean, scientists uh, or grad students just in general, I mean, at some point they're going to have to do presentations. Sure, yeah. they, uh, certainly if they're doing their PhD, they're going to have to teach. Yeah. Um, but even just one-on-one -on -one interactions, how do they, how can they communicate better even at one-on-one? -on -one? Right. So much of the work we do is, is actually it's very, very similar to what I use when I'm teaching improvisers or actors. Yeah. Um, it, it, some of the focus is a little different. Um, um, and obviously it's not directed so much towards, you know, performance per se. Right. Although, again, a presentation is a bit of a performance. Yeah, and if sure. you're in front of a, a, a class, to some degree you are performing. Yeah. Um, 
uh, I mean, hopefully you're not taking on a wildly different character. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe, maybe that's a good thing. I don't know. <laughs> what gets your point across? Today I'm going to teach you physics. And I'm going to be King Lear. <laughs> 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 Sorry. You can cut that bit. No, it's staying. <laughs> um, um, so, yeah. So, it, it, and it's, it's kind of, to me, it's kind of amazing because you know, the thing that we're discovering <laughs> is that these grad students, I mean, they, first of all, they're, they're coming to the work because they know they need help, right. which is great. Yeah. Because, because then they make really good um participants in sure. there because they know they need something yeah i mean they're terrified usually oh that's fun but they need they, they know they need need it but the the thing that amazes me is that a lot of times they're they're you know we'll do a class so we do a class on status the next week somebody will come back and they'll go oh last week i had this thing that i had to do and i decided to try to alter just a little bit my status oh, wow. usually i come in low status but i thought oh, i'm going to try and exert you know people ignore me when i do that so i thought i'd you know exert a little bit wow. higher status and you know people were asking me more questions you know th th so they're, they're they're using it in practical application almost immediately right that's which fantastic. i think is in incredibly brave yeah and uh, and we're getting lots of really good anecdotal feedback. And so uh, ultimately, uh, Jeff would like to have a science communications course yeah. that improvisation would be a component of. And um, most recently, the, 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 the class that I'm teaching right now, um, these are usually five weeks long. So there's five classes, two hours a week. Okay. So not a lot of time, yeah. 10 hours. Um, but the current class, uh, we started a couple of weeks ago or a few weeks ago, and uh, and Jeff uh, told me that this was, a, a, now it was a credit course. Really? And so they had to expand it to six classes oh to, to make it credit course. And of course, there's grading now. They, they, they I mean, I'm not really involved in that end of it, but wow. now they have to think, well, how do we grade this course? Yeah, I was going to say, how do you? Well, participation yeah. is one of the key elements. Bravery. Like if you don't, like if you don't show up, to two classes, you're you're probably not getting what you need. Right. <laughs> so yeah. you're probably not going to get the credit. Um, and then they're gonna they're gonna have to. There's gonna be a written component at the end, and and there's a few a couple of other things elements that they've put in. But again, ultimately, this is to <clears throat> hopefully at some point have a full course. Because and and really the credit really goes to Jeff because he, he recognized that there was an issue. Yeah. He saw that, you know, that these students really needed something. And he went out and, you know, investigated and yeah. found something that he thought was really useful. And then miraculously kept finding funding to keep this this course going. Oh, that's so great. And and is, you know, um, is still working at trying to expand on that and. And so, you know, really, I mean, if it wasn't for him, this none of this would be going on. Yeah. Um, and for me, it's brilliant because I'm at a point in my career where I'm looking for other challenges. And, yeah. I, and almost so I'm really interested in what's value improvisation has beyond the stage. Sure. I mean, I kind of know what that is, or yeah. at least I think I know what that is. But now I'm looking at is okay. Well, there's obviously other applications for this work, and 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 also like it's interesting to see the difference between teaching a, a group of scientists, grad students, and teaching actors, or teaching a group of improvisers, or teaching business people. You know, yeah. and, and I've I've done all of those, and it's really interesting seeing the differences in those those groups. Huh. And then trying to figure out why are they so different or why are they similar? Yeah. Hey, hey, so not to <laughs> just cause, uh, do you, do you have a favorite group to work with? And, and, and it's an unfair question because I know that they probably all have got their, own. I, well, <clears throat> I, I, first of all, I like working with groups that want to be there. Right. I mean, and, and obviously, I mean, if you, if you hold a workshop and, and, People pay for the workshop or, or whatever they attend. You theoretically they want right. to be there, <clears throat> but 
but that's not necessarily always the case. Yeah. And it's like, you know, when I used to teach in, in schools, like, you know, we would go do workshops in, in high school, for example. Yeah. You know, quite often, it, it, if you were teaching grade tens, it was difficult because they don't necessarily want to be there. Right. They've taken grade 10 drama because it's, they think it's an easy credit or their friend right. is taking it, but they're not taking it because they want to learn about drama. Yeah. <clears throat> Whereas when you get into grade 11, grade 12, the attitude switches. Yeah. Now they want to be there <clears throat> and they want to improve their skills. So, you know, any group, any group, it's really nice if they really, really want to be there. That's why the, 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 the science grad students yeah. are really fun to work with. Right. Um, and, but other than that, I mean, it's, yeah, no, it's, I think that really comes down to how much they really want it. Yeah. And, <clears throat> and if they're not, it's really helpful if they're not super, I'm not sure what the right word is, but I'll use the word defensive. Um, I don't mind people asking questions. I don't mind people, um, questioning what, what I have to say or what yeah. I have to offer. I think that's good. I think you shouldn't just, you know immediately bow down and go, oh, yeah. yeah. But on the other hand, uh, you sometimes see resistance where, where like there's no reason for it. They're resisting a concept without actually testing it. Right. Whereas I think test the concept and then come back and say, oh, that's not for me, or I don't think this works or whatever, but, but at least do the work yeah. and then make a decision. But sometimes you get people in classes that are, they're, <laughs> they're, they're not even trying before they they question it. Right. They've already got the it's it figured. Yeah, that's right. And yeah. and and I mean again, I mean there may be lots of different reasons for that, but but it it's to me it's counterproductive. Is that if you're gonna take a class, at least just sort of do the work, listen to what's being said, test it out, and then if it's not for you, it's not for you. Yeah. I mean, everybody learns differently, everybody has different ways of, of going about things and, and certain methodology might not be right for you. Yeah, right. <clears throat> but at least try it. Yeah. If you're or, going to take the class, I mean, or don't come to the class. I mean, that, that's fine too. Or know? it could be something that you just don't understand at the time, but later on you'll be like, oh, that's what well, he was talking well, about. Well, that's the thing is yeah. that, I, and I know this from experience with Keith is that, you know, cause I worked with Keith a long, long time and, and I would, you know, attend a lot of his classes and workshops over the years <clears throat> and sometimes, you know, repeating material that over, you know, many, many times over a period of time. And it would be like the 16th time <laughs> and the light bulb would go off and I'd see the connection or right. I'd see, aha, that's it. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and so, yeah, if they're, if they're, if they want to be there and then they're open, that's great. Yeah. And again, like I said, I, I certainly don't mind people questioning techniques. I certainly don't mind people questioning the theory behind the techniques, but at least stay open to the sure. possibility. Yeah. Uh, what are, what are your favorite uh, types of scene work like on stage? Oh, I don't, I have a difficult time with f favorites and sure. it really depends. That's it's, why I ask the hard questions. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like when people say, what's your favorite movie? Well, yeah, sure. I don't know, you know, um, or I guess maybe, maybe what I'm asking is, you know, it's not like I like word at a time scenes, but <laughs> it, maybe it, maybe you've already said it. It's, it's about being vulnerable on stage and uh, taking risks on stage. Like what, what I really, I really like is when, <clears throat> whatever the work you're doing is feels effortless. Right. And, and it's truly spontaneous. Uh, and, you know, I've talked to other performers about this and not just about improvisation, but about other forms of performance. And I think, I mean, you're a musician and yeah. I think, you know, this, you get into a groove right. or you get into a zone Yeah. And it's effortless. You're no longer thinking what you need to do. You're just no in long, that moment. It's, and... You're in that moment and it's just happening. Yeah. And it doesn't, and it seems like you can, in a way, you can, you can watch it from, from <laughs> you know, you, you're watching it. And, and as long as you don't force it or think about it too much, it'll just, you'll stay on that, yeah. that wave. Yeah, yeah. That to me is what, you know, ultimately what, what. I really enjoy when I'm performing is where it just seems effortless and nice and it's whatever's happening is happening. 
And and that's why and that's why it's so important and why we keep driving home this concept of you need to be in the moment. Yeah. You need to be there. Yeah. And not trying to control what's happening. But it's so difficult. Oh yeah. Well, it's, it's so difficult. It, and I see it in class uh, when I'm doing stuff on in class sometimes it's easy, but then as soon as the lights go up and you have an audience and intuitively I know that it's no different. But my brain is like, yeah, gets in because the, way. the audience adds that pressure, yeah. right? It, it adds that element of whatever it is, whatever you you are thinking about the audience, you know. And for some people, it's you know, do they like me? Do they think I'm funny? Do they think I'm entertaining? It, it, this becomes this noise. Yeah, yeah. Whereas in the class, sometimes you can get wonderful scene work or yeah. wonderful, you know, effects. Yeah. But since you put, like Keith used to say, it's all theory until you put it in front of an audience. Sure. Which, uh, you know, I've yeah. always, but yeah, it's absolutely true. <laughs> right. And, and, but again, it's, it's process. Yeah. You, 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 hopefully you, you get those moments in a class, in a workshop and you feel like, oh yeah, okay. I, I have an idea of what this is like. Right. And it's, if the work is done well, then it's in your body. Right. You know, so you get that sense. Okay. I know what this feels like. Then you have to go and try, well, not even try. You shouldn't right. try, but <laughs> there is no there try. Is no. <laughs> <laughs> you then have to go and, and allow that process to continue when you do things in front of an audience. And, and yeah. it takes time. And, and I think a lot of times people just sort of give up. You know, they, they find easier solutions. Sure. Well, this is where you see performers plat- plateau. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I was going to ask, and this might be the perfect time, but what scares you? Or does anything scare you anymore on stage? Like, do you go looking for that um, to push that boundary? Um, I don't I don't feel like I really get nervous before shows anymore. I mean, not the same way. I mean, yeah. there's a certain amount of kind of performance energy. Yeah. I, I don't really equate it with being nervous, but maybe it is. But I don't really get nervous anymore. <clears throat> um, but, you know, it's I well, you know, the, here's the thing is that <clears throat> sometimes you're on stage and you're looking at your partner in the scene and you realize they don't have anything. Right. Or maybe you realize that they're not even there. <laughs> <laughs> They've checked. <out. laughs> and now you feel like, oh, now it's up to me. Right. And, and I'm still kind of trying to deal with that. I see, I think, I think really good improvisers always make their partners look better. Right. Of course. And so that's, you know, that's the, uh, that's still a work in progress for me. Isn't that something? You know, that, 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 because sometimes I I go, oh, um, okay. (laughs) I need to do something now. (laughs) Just can't ride on my laurels. it's not, it's not necessarily fear. It's just. Again, it's process. It's it's how can I how can I be there for my partner even when they're not necessarily there? Right. Or how and can how you can find I, them? And yeah. Bring them back. How, yeah. How can I bring them back? <laughs> like you know, I've I've known improvisers who seem to have this really wonderful ability to always make their partners look better. Right. And 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 I hope that I can do that sometimes. Yeah. But there's you know it's not a consistent thing. Huh. So th- there's that, and there's challenges. Like I've not like the thing is, is that and I've uh, I've thought this way for years now. <clears throat> I'm I I've never had a perfect evening. It's not like it's always brilliant, right? right. Or even even brilliant <laughs> occasionally. So it's still work. It's still it's still something that I is a challenge. Are you chasing the perfect evening? Like, is that not really? Because I know it doesn't exist. Yeah. Okay. You know, it 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 just doesn't exist. And but it it's it, it's it. I guess what I'm saying is is that it's always a challenge. Yeah. Like, you know, I say to people is like word at a time. I think is a very difficult game to play. Yeah. And it's certainly difficult in performance. And I think even if you're very skilled, very experienced, there's a good chance it's going to screw up. Oh, sure. But that's the reason to do it. Yeah. If you only gravitate towards what's easy, then you just, again, you plateau. Right. And again, I've seen people that I thought were really funny, really entertaining, uh, and good improvisers get to a point where they become satisfied with 
whatever they're doing. Sure. That's their thing now. Yeah. And, they and there's, count there's on a certain it. amount of success and, yeah. and people like them and whatever. I mean, they, 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 they do well with it, but it, it, it kind of means that they're not growing or they're not yeah. being challenged. So, I mean, the good news is, is if you're just starting out in improvisation, there's years and years and years <laughs> <laughs> to find that plateau. <laughs> but I think it's like any, any, anything that you do, you, if you become so self-satisfied, oh, I'm, I'm here, I'm done it. Yeah. <laughs> then you probably should stop doing it. Yeah, sure. What do you think about, uh, so at Loose Moose, we do kid shows. Yeah. So we're semi-scripted. Yeah. Well, uh, and, but it's been a while since I've seen a script scripted or a uh you know like a, a ben hur or a um it, oh god was it mutiny on the bounty oh yeah uh you know or or like i don't want to say proper theater but a you know some uh like an actual play well <clears throat> for I, adults i guess there's 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 uh, I, I think there's a couple of different reasons for that um when when the moose was at what we, we fondly refer to as the simplex. Yeah, up on uh, Eric Mc, McKnight. Yeah, the, yeah. that. So, uh, first of all, we had we had a lot more in terms of support, in terms of staff. Right. Uh, and also, Keith taught at the university. So he had an immediate conduit to, to acting students. Right. So there was this constant stream of people that that had some acting skills. So if you wanted to do that, and we did, you know, we did plays. Yeah. Um, you know, we did Pinter and we did, you know, we did Waiting for Godot and we did, you know, we did, we did plays. Um, and certainly those plays, I think, I think you have to have some, some acting chops. So, so, but, but that was, they were always there. And we also, because we took that space, we realized we needed to fill the time there right so we had a complete season of of adult plays we had a complete season of children's plays yeah and then we did the improvisation shows um but we had a full-time production manager we had a full-time manager a full-time front house manager right. and usually we had one or two other people hanging around and then for a period of time i became the associate director to do the day-to-day -day sort of artistic stuff that yeah. keith and mel couldn't do because they had regular day jobs, right. Keith teaching at the university and Mel being a veterinarian. Right. So there was all of this support. And then when we moved to the Gary, we continued to do plays. But again, we still had, I think we had four full-time staff and we usually, usually had one or two part-time or, or yeah. casual people. Well, we haven't had that for many years. Yeah, that's fair. And we don't have the same conduit of actors coming through. Um, I mean, it'd be nice. I'd, I'd really like to do that. But between doing a full season of children's plays and then the improvisation shows, yeah. we're we're pretty well at our limit or, well, probably over our limit right. as to what we should be doing. So I, I, that's our long answer for, for a short question. Yeah. But, but it is kind of complicated. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. Huh. What? Uh, oh, so um, this is uh, going to be the, the, the box break. So uh -oh. I, I was I was saying before we got started here that there's um, I have a sponsor. So the sponsor is the Friday Sock Company. Oh. I, I thought these moose socks would be kind of perfect for you, but they're uh, moose and beaver socks. So they're uh, <clears throat> ethically made, purposefully mismatched socks. Oh, and um, and also I have some for Deborah. Oh, I, nice. Because I think that she'd get a kick out of. Uh, fox and uh, fox rat and, and trash panda socks. Trash panda. <laughs> I've never heard of that before. Fox raccoon. Yeah. Ah, so nice. Thank you. Yeah. These guys. Well, they're local. They're Calgary. Oh, they're local. Yeah. Lovely. Yeah. And they're even uh, better. Yeah. Super cool. So you end up with you know like a moose on one foot and the beaver on the other foot, and uh, yeah, they're the great company and uh, they uh, they're advocates of the show. Oh, oh God! There you go. Wow, yeah. good sponsor. I know, right? Yeah, it's like yeah. you know, they're not like dumping waste into right into you know ponds. Ponds. <laughs> <laughs> We're sponsored by a company that dumps waste into ponds. <laughs> That's not clean, sir. <laughs> 
Uh, well, thank you. Yeah, you're very welcome. I will wear them proudly. Excellent. Um, what's next for you? What's next? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I've lived my whole life that on. way. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it's just continuation of, I mean, I'm still doing the most. Um, I'm really interested in what's happening with the actor science things at the university. I'd like to yeah. see. Would you grow that? Well, we'll see. I mean, it's like I said, I mean, it's really Jeff's ball. I mean, it's Jeff's project in that. And, and I'm just going along for the ride. Yeah. Um, but there's been a couple of other things that have come up at the university as well recently that, that I'm looking at and, and hopefully, you know, we'll see some more. I, again, I, I'm just I'm really kind of I'm at a point, I think, where I just uh, looking for other opportunities to, to do this work. Yeah. And I mean, I'm still maintaining the other stuff. Like I'm still like, I still like teaching, you know, at the Moose and, and um, uh, I've been teaching actors recently, which you think is, you know, it's, it's, uh, improvisers, actors, is something different. Yes, oh, there totally is. Different, yeah, there's yeah. different. So, but doing that, y- using the improvisation techniques of Keith to, oh, to cool. work with actors, which is ongoing um is that like a a a one-on-one thing do people no no it's so i mean i i did a whole bunch of work with it It was the citadel theater from edmonton and the the bamp center did a program uh professional development program for actors so these were actors that are already in career yeah and so the idea was is that they would be hired to do a performance at the citadel but they would go to bamp for i think a month or longer wow and they would have intensive classes in various different things. And one of them was improvisation. So I did that for seven years. That's I would awesome. just go up for three or four days and, yeah. and do, you know, uh, improvisation workshops. And then that led to um, a couple of other opportunities, uh, teaching at Stratford and then teaching at Dalhousie in, in Halifax. Yeah. Master classes there. And now, um, last year, I got invited to teach at the National Theatre School. Damn. And they invited me back. So what? I guess I didn't. Fools. I didn't, you know, <laughs> what are they thinking? <laughs> but it's, it, again, it's really interesting for me to work. And, and, and again, like, like National Theatre School, they're, they're young. They're, they're yeah. first year students there. So they're all late teens, early 20s. They're really young. But on the other hand, they're, they're there for a reason. They yeah. want to be actors. So again, they, they fulfill that element. Yeah. They want to be there. Um, and the interesting thing for me is that actors quite often are terrified of improvisation. Yeah. And, and sometimes what you find out is that they've had a bad experience in high school where only the funny boys got attention, which right. is uh, problematic. And sometimes it's just because they do not understand that improvisation is not necessarily just about being funny and witty and sure. clever. Yeah. That there are elements of improvisation that are absolutely perfect for for actor development. Um, again, I mean, it's the same issues. Actors need to be in the moment as well. Yeah. Um, so well, you can tell when they, they're not. Yeah, oh, absolutely. You know yeah. when it's genuine and when, when it's not. You know when they can be vulnerable and when they're not. Yeah. And those are those are trademarks of, of, of being in the moment. And so, and status work. Again, it, it's like unlocking like a secret world yeah. once you start to understand status work. So again, a lot of the stuff that you, very same techniques using to train improvisers, using them to train actors, but again, slightly different focus, Mm -hmm. slightly different um, uh, approach, but, but basically the same work. So again, hopefully that will continue. And I mean, I just read recently that you're in this, this is horribly depressing for younger people, but for me, it's kind of okay. Is that I think you, I think the article was saying that you, you peak your creative um, um, work peaks, I think, at the, uh, like in your 40s or something like that. Wow. And then it's all downhill from there. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the thing that the, the article said is that the one thing that, that, uh, that they have discovered doesn't, you know, come to a halt is teaching. Yeah. And that's why you can teach well into your 60s, 70s, or, you know, in, in the case of Keith Johnson, he, he's yeah. still teaching in his 80s. Yeah. So there's, there's hope. There's hope. <laughs> <laughs> and it might be total nonsense. I mean, it was just an article. And, and oh. so, so if anybody's getting depressed because they just turned 41. <laughs> Jen. 
oops, uh, then, then, you know, then it's not, it's, you know, I don't think it's a hard, hard line. Right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, 40. Oh, oh, and you're done. And you're done. Yeah. I think, and actually, I think there's a lot to be said about experience and, and confidence yeah. that you can continue creative output well into your oh, for later, sure. later years. Yeah. But there is, I think, again, I think that's why you see like a lot of creative artists, the, the, the really sort of groundbreaking work is early in their career. Yeah. And then they're still producing and they're probably still producing very worthwhile work. Yeah. But it doesn't have that, you know, impact. Right. When you're younger. Yeah. But anyways, but like I said, if, if I can teach, you know, well into my later years, then that would be good. Yeah. That's, are, do you have a book in you? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh. uh, it keeps coming up. Uh, you know, the thing is, is that um, to be... To be totally honest, I've never developed the discipline it requires to be a writer. Yeah. I try. Every once in a while, I, you know, I, 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 I will write. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a discipline. It's really a discipline. Yeah. You, have to, you have to find a time and you have to do it. Yeah. <clears throat> and so maybe, but, I, but again, it's, it's, it's. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and on that happy note. <laughs> well, I, I'll, I'll leave you. So, so years ago, Keith, Keith suggested that somebody should write a book about what it's like to be an improviser. Right. Because nobody's written that. I yeah. mean, there's lots of, there's t so many improvisation books out there. And that's the other reason not to write another improvisation book. Right. There's so many books out there. I was thinking like memoirs, uh, uh, you know, uh, Things that lessons from the great moose. I don't know. Well, this the, the idea of writing what it's like to be an improviser kind of always stuck with me. Yeah. I'm just not sure if it's a, if it's a pamphlet <laughs> or it's a book. Yeah. Well, I but guess. but it, it but there is something about that. What's it like to go through that process? The that that might be interesting. Yeah. And I haven't seen one of those yet. Well, there. Oh, who knows? Yeah. Are you going to write a book? It, yeah, I've got a couple on the go. Do, oh, do you? Yeah. Oh, you have discipline. Well, no. <laughs> well, what's your secret, Michael? I'm going to turn this around. Oh, what's shit. your secret, Michael? Sitting down and writing. <laughs> oh, <Yeah>. darn. <laughs> it was that simple. <laughs> it was in front of you <laughs> all along. Sitting down and writing. Yeah, uh, just gotta well, write. I, yeah I, that's the thing. I mean, if you can do that. Yeah. You know, I mean, and any time I've had to write and you sit down and you, and you have yeah. to do it. It'll come. It's like quitting smoking. Like the, the secret to quitting smoking is just don't. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Right? And well, the, uh, the other thing is, is that statistically, I believe you have to quit seven times on average oh, to actually quit. To quit. Interesting. Yeah. So you have to keep doing like you quit. Yeah. People quit and then they have one cigarette and they go, ah, I'm yeah, smoking well, again. I'll try it again. I'll buy a pack. Yeah. Might as well. <laughs> right. So, yeah. but the trick is, is to not let that get you down. Right. You have that one cigarette. That's fine. Yeah. Boom. You quit again. Right. Same thing with writing, I think is. If well, you, there, I didn't, I hadn't thought about that because I did quit smoking years ago. Yeah. So I know what that's like. Maybe I can write. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Michael. I've I'm going to go write a book. <laughs> yes. Get this microphone out of my way. <laughs> I need to write. <laughs> Paris <laughs> socks. <laughs> Paris. Oh, you Paris pair of socks and the ability to write. Right. And a, and a pipe. <laughs> and a pipe. <laughs> but nothing else. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah, leave you with that image. Wow, thanks. <laughs> uh, so I, I've, I've got a, a at the end of these things, I like to ask, you know, what advice you would have for rebels in waiting or people who are wanting to sort of go off on their next adventure. Maybe they want to go on stage. Maybe they've always thought about doing it. Um, maybe it's a business thing and they're just scared shitless of doing it. Do you have um, advice for those people to face fears? <sighs> Well, first of all, yeah, you, you have to embrace failure. Yeah. I think, you know, I, and I don't think that's a big secret, but it, it's absolutely true. Yeah. You have to embrace failure. And that, what I mean by that is that you have to get used to the idea that you will fail. Yeah. A, a, any endeavor and certainly creative endeavors, you're going to fail. It's just a part of the, it's a part of the process. Get over it. Um, don't punish yourself. You fail. Everybody fails. Yeah. Don't beat yourself up. Don't, don't hold it. You know, the egos are such fragile things. And then go forward. 
Yeah. I mean, again, any endeavor is about going forward. And certainly creative endeavors are about going forward. Yeah. Um, it's got to move the plot. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it you have, yeah. If you, if you want to achieve something, you, <clears throat> if you have a setback, if you have, if something comes up, it's a problem or something failed on you, you know, acknowledge it, yeah. learn from it, move on. Like quitting smoking. Like quitting smoking. Yeah. You have to do it at an average of seven times. <laughs> <laughs> you fail, you go back and do it again. Are you Smith Corona guy or word processor guy? Oh, I, well, word processor. Yeah. I, I, I'd probably be happier just writing longhand if my, my handwriting was legible. <laughs> but I'd write something and then wouldn't know what it said like right. a day later. But it'd be brilliant. Um, although I do love, I, I love how, I love how typewriters work. I love the me mechanics. Yeah. Deborah, it, my son gave, uh, my Deborah, um, a keyboard, um, that is, it's mechanic. It's for, for a computer, but it has the mechanical keys. It has, and they're, the keys are round what? and it's brilliant. Oh my God. It takes a while to get used to because yeah. you're used to clack, 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 clack. clack. I'm hitting the microphone now. Bang, bang. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's brilliant. Wow. So someday when I grow up, I want one of those. Nice. <laughs> I think because it slows you down. It, 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 it's a different process. Yeah. My son writes and, and he used a typewriter for a while and he was talking about how it changes things and he writes longhand yeah. as well. And I've heard other writers say that, that it's different. It, it, you're, it, it, Whatever something changes in in how you you work when you work longhand or you work mechanically, yeah, as well, opposed to. Blah, blah, blah. And I miss like, whoops, <laughs> I, hit the microphone. I miss like. No, we all know what that action yeah. is. Well, of a certain age, you know what that action right. is. And for your kids, <laughs> yeah, read a book. That's right. No red squiggly lines under our <laughs> manuscript. Yeah, yeah. No, so, I, I do miss that a lot. Actually, that whole. Well, tap, 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 and tap. again, apparently it is, it, it's, it's, it changes how you work when mm -hmm. you work mechanically as opposed to whatever that, whatever that is. That is the fingers. Yeah. Yeah. Electronically. <laughs> That's been awesome. Uh, <laughs> or maybe, maybe I could just dictate a book I get a microphone and. Oh, there you go. Just sit in your chair. Sit in my chair. <laughs> blather, blather, <clears throat> blather. In my Dennis Cahill. It was back in 1972. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> I was three. I was th you were three? <laughs> yeah. I was not. <laughs> yeah. I was 17. That's awesome. Fresh, yeah. fresh faced. Fresh faced, yeah. Getting rid of the clarinet, moving on. Moving, getting rid of the clarinet. <laughs> Thank you, Charlie. <laughs> if it wasn't for Charlie, <laughs> none of this would have I wouldn't happened. be here. Wow. Well, really, I mean, I don't weird? think so. I mean, I don't think I would have. I think I, I ah, God only knows. Because my attitude towards school at that point was not really good. I think that's a really cool thing. Like the influence that just little decisions have that ripple through everything. Yeah. 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 Where, where would you be yeah. if it wasn't? I mean, Keith, it was, it was, this was years ago. Keith, we were sitting in the green room and Keith was said, there was a group of us and he said, oh, where would you all be? If it wasn't, you know, like basically, I think he was saying, what have I done? <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> what have I done to you all? But it's, it, you know, it, yeah. interesting thought. You, you, you miss an opportunity or you don't take an opportunity. Yeah. And, and then that never happened. Yeah. Oh, wow. Possible futures. Yikes. In a parallel universe. In a parallel universe. What is parallel Dennis doing? Oh, God. I went to, I mean, I went to university to become a high school drama teacher because that seemed practical to me. And yeah. I'm glad I'm not. Yeah. I'm re really. Yeah. I'd, no, that's, that'd be I'd tough I'd be miserable. Job. Yeah. More miserable than I am now. Imagine that. So crotchety. Ugh. So crotchety. <laughs> <laughs> I do love your Your notes are so kind right now. <laughs> <laughs> right now. Yeah. Just, well, it's funny because anybody that knows me from years ago, I mean, and there's still some people around who, you know, will talk about the, 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 the different dentist that used to give notes. Yeah. And, uh, well, I don't, well, yeah, I, I mean, I don't think, I don't think I was ever, I wasn't, I don't think I was ever really vicious, but sometimes I would say things that like my, the one that I remember is, is telling a, a, a group of performers at the moose after a show that they could all be replaced. <laughs> and, 
needless to say, some people didn't take that very well. <laughs> Although, I have been proven correct because yeah. almost all of them have been replaced. <laughs> <laughs> but I would say things like that, or, yeah. you know. Uh, I, I don't do that as much anymore. Um, although every once in a while, the old Dennis comes out. And yeah, I kind of like seeing that that, uh, that that rear up. But I was it, it got me thinking that I, I like the <laughs> I like the fact that notes at the moose are for me, anyways. You can do with them what you want. Yes. So it's not like it's a note. You, yeah. You take the note, like have, yeah. have it, and then decide what to do with it later. Well, like I was saying about about teaching, is that that yeah, don't it, like. It's fine. Like if you disagree, that's fine. Yeah. It's good. Okay, fine. But at least you've taken the information. Yeah. And it took years for the moose to develop that note giving session. I mean, there were early on, there were, there were screaming, yelling arguments, Jeez. to the point where there was, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> I won't mention names, but there were there was a you know, um, uh, let's go out to the parking lot and work this out. What? Yeah, yeah. Oh my god! It, but again, it it took a long time to develop a different culture, right? Where now the notes—that's what it is. You 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 know, and and also trying to develop a culture where people understand that sometimes it's there are occasions when it's better not to give the note, right? Or to give the note for their ability, yeah, or, right? or, yeah. or where they're at on the particular journey. But you know <clears> that that and that takes time. And but I think it's interesting now watching new people come in. Um, sometimes you'll see a new person who, who doesn't understand that. And, and, you know, that's reasonable because they're just new Yeah. and it takes them a little while to go, Oh, okay, wait a minute. I don't have to be defensive about this. Right. I don't have to, I don't have to take a note and then immediately give a note to somebody else because right. I feel, you know, Yeah. Uh, but it's, it's really interesting how people kind of, you know, can slide into it. And I think. You know, I, I think it's been very healthy to have note sessions like that. Yeah, I think there are groups that avoid giving notes because they've never gotten that that culture. Yeah. Um, so you know, yeah, it, it, it's it's uh, yeah. I think as as humans, it's nice to get a note. Do you know what I mean? Like, uh, well, then people are paying attention re to you. relationships yeah. where you go, well, I have a note. Oh, fuck. <laughs> but to to like listen to what that note is and be like, okay. Thanks for that. Yeah. And, and it's like, you know, we've often said too, is like if you get a note from one person, well, it might be just the, their opinion. Right. Now maybe it's a, it's a, it's a educated opinion, but it's just an opinion. Yeah. But if you get that note from two or three different people, right. Then maybe that's time you really should be paying attention. Yeah. Uh, because then, then it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's probably a, a, a really good note. Yeah. Um, and again, like you said, you don't have to take the note. Yeah. Um, sometimes it's good just to sit with it, right? Totally. What does that mean? What, what does it mean to me? Yeah. How does that fit into the world yeah. view? And, yeah. And I don't think, and, and again, and also just it, the notes don't have to be, they're not angry. They're not vicious. Right. They're not, they're just a note. We watched this scene and this happened. Right. Um, you, you m maybe next time you want to try to approach it a different way or yeah. were you paying attention when, you know, something that we did in class, perfect example of it on stage. Right. You know, yeah. and just being cognizant of that. Because again, it's process. Right. It's not immediate result. And it's never going to be perfect. Yeah. And never. Never going to be perfect. Get over it. <laughs> <laughs> and if you are perfect, go away. Right. Don't. Yeah. Don't come to the show. Don't come to the show. <laughs> Leave us alone. Yeah. <laughs> Let us live in our little imperfect bubble. Yes. Um, <laughs> this has been awesome. Thanks, Dennis. I really appreciate. Well, I hope it. I hope it didn't blather on for too long. Oh, it was great. You, you feed me coffee, and I, I'm likely to. Right. You know, just. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny doing podcasts because you know you do hand right. actions and they mean nothing. I've often thought about setting up cameras. Oh God! And, but I, it, I, I think I did it once, and it changed the dynamic. Yeah, no, it's well, you even know? microphones can change the dynamic. You have to yeah. kind of forget the microphones yeah. there and have a conversation. Exactly. But I know, uh, yeah, they, they, these can be super intimidating if you start to think about what's yeah, actually like, going on and your voice is going down this wire into the other room, the room and it's being recorded, yeah. and then it's going to go on a podcast, which is going to be on the 
the oh. internet for all time. So whatever crap you were saying oh is God. out there and you can't pull it back. I'm paralyzed with fear now, Dennis. <laughs> God damn well, it. That's, see, the other beauty of getting to a certain age is that you start to give, give less of a crap. <laughs> <laughs> so you're going to be sitting on your front porch just wearing your socks. <laughs> just the socks. Just the socks. And yeah. don't, I don't give a crap, don't right? Don't give a crap. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> I think that'll be the title of this episode. Don't give a crap. Don't give a crap. <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> I, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want a note, Michael? <laughs> Yes, give me the Sometimes note. Sometimes you grasp on to titles too quickly. <laughs> Good note. Thanks for the note. Thanks for listening, and don't forget to subscribe wherever you get your favorite podcasts. It could be like Apple Podcasts or Spotify or pretty much anywhere else. Um, we're also online at rebelrebelpod.com, and check us out on social media. Until next time, thanks for listening.